Okay. Our next presenter is going to unveil uh, the most hugely popular American sports craze that most of us had no idea ever existed. Uh, and it turns out that pedestrianism is not about being trite and, and mundane. Uh, and pedestrianism has nothing to do with crosswalks. Uh, Matt Algio, who is the author of several popular books, he's one of these fellows that is in the admirable, posi uh, admirable position of finding interesting subjects and then writing books about them. Uh, it, it, he's going to tell us about a fascinating, long-forgotten, highly competitive uh, sport. Yes. Matthew. Thank you, uh, Richard. Um, yeah, I've, I've been lucky to find a lot of uh, very non-lucrative uh, topics to write about <laughs> over the past 10 years. Um, and so uh, pedestrianism is one of those. Uh, I should probably tell you a little bit about how I, I came to write about uh, this, this particular topic and uh, in doing so can plug a couple of my other books. Uh, I wrote a book in uh, 2006, first book I wrote, uh, was a book about the 1943 Steagles. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Steagles. Uh, the NFL was so short of players in 1943 due to World War II uh, that they were forced to merge two teams, the Steelers and the Eagles, and they became the Steagles for a season. And, uh, you know, of course, the quarterback had a perforated eardrum and the running backs got ulcers and the wide receiver was blind in one eye, that sort of thing. And so it was uh, while researching uh, the Steagles that I went and looked back at uh, the history of American sports, sort of a broad sense, and uh, discovered that uh, in the 1870s, especially a very short period, really the late 1870s to the early 1880s, uh, competitive walking, and uh, it was known as pedestrianism in the papers, uh, was a very, very popular sport in the United States. And, really was the uh, highest attended sport and the players were the highest compensated for a, for a short period of time. And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the history of pedestrianism while I show you some slides that I've uh, found along the way. Uh, actually, do you, mind, do you mind if I take this off? Can I, camera guy? Okay. All right, there we go. Uh, the uh, first slide I'll show you, and really the history of pedestrianism goes back into the early 19th century, and it was in 1809 that this gentleman, a guy named Captain Barkley, Robert uh, uh, Allardyce Barkley, but he was known as Captain Barkley, uh, he made a wager. He was a Scottish gentleman, and uh, he made a wager with a friend that he could walk 1,000 miles, one mile every hour for 1,000 consecutive hours, and that's about 41 days. The wager was for 1,000 guineas, which was a lot of money. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the friend accepted the wager, and uh, Captain Barkley started on this walk in the summer of 1809. And uh, he simply walked a half mile up the road from his house and a half mile back every hour. He did have an ingenious way, though, of, uh, of getting a little more rest. He would, he would time the miles so he would walk one mile right at the close, at the end of one hour, pause a beat, and then go out and walk the next mile at the beginning of the next hour. So he'd go for a walk, say, at 11.50, come back at noon, wait a minute, and then go for a walk at noon. And so this fulfilled the requirements of walking in consecutive hours, uh, though his friend didn't think it was very gentlemanly of him to, uh, to do this. Uh, he did manage to do the walk in, uh, in uh, uh, a thousand consecutive hours. And uh, by the end of the walk, it was a huge sensation. And uh, crowds came from all over the UK to come see him walk at a town called Newmarket. And uh, it was in all the papers. And pedestrianism really took off from that, displays of competitive walking. And uh, here's an example of a, of a, uh, a handbill, uh, I guess. Uh, my, my terminology for the ephemera might not be perfect, so please correct me. Uh, but I, I believe this is a handbill, something that would have been handed out to advertise a walk in the town of Alnwick in England, which is up uh, uh, near Newcastle, I believe. And uh, trying to walk 100 miles in 24 hours was kind of the uh, gold standard of showing your walking skills. And so this young man, uh, who is, I believe, just, yes, 15 years old, uh, proposed to walk 102 miles in 24 successive hours. And uh, it, it was kind of a, you know, I guess it would be the equivalent of what hitting 
uh, 50 home runs in a season, that sort of thing, if you could walk 100 miles in 24 hours. And so you would see this often and then, you know, try to take it up a couple notches, walk 101 uh, or 102. It was considered a, an exceptional accomplishment. Um, just in the way of uh, my own, uh, to give myself a little plug here, uh, yeah, I am entered in a 24-hour race in, uh, in New Jersey next month, and so I will attempt to walk 50 miles in uh, 24 hours. And so uh, we'll see. Uh, I, I, I need to, uh, uh, some of my, uh, my wife decided, well, you've been writing about these guys <laughs> and their walking feats. So she did a little research. Uh, yeah, so to, that gets me out of the house, uh, at least for 24 hours. And so uh, all throughout, really, the first half of the, uh, of the 19th century, uh, in the UK, uh, walking feats were fairly common. It was less so in the United States. It, it really wasn't until uh, right around 1860, 1861, uh, that uh, walking became very popular in the United States. This is uh, Edward Payson Weston, and uh, he was pretty much the most famous uh, walker in the, uh, in the early days of the phenomenon. Uh, this is another bet that was made that contributed to the rise of uh, competitive walking. In the autumn of uh, 1860, Weston made a bet with a friend that Lincoln would lose the presidential election that fall. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but Lincoln did in fact win the election in 1860. Uh, Weston uh, lost the bet. The loser of the bet had to walk from Boston to uh, Washington in 10 days uh, to witness the inauguration. And uh, this was a very, very arduous task, unlike today when it would be a breeze. Uh, but back in 1861, which uh, the inauguration was in March at that time, uh, it was very difficult to walk uh, long distances over land. Of course, the roads were not paved, and in winter they'd either be muddy or frozen and slippery. And so the idea that somebody would walk from Boston to Washington to witness the inauguration was so preposterous that it really got a lot of media attention. The newspapers covered Weston's walk, and he was a shrewd guy. He was really a kind of an entrepreneur, and uh, he uh, decided that uh, he could fund the, fund the walk by selling souvenir cards of himself. And this is one of those cards that he would sell along the way. Um, and uh, he, was very, he was very conscious about self-promotion. He notified all the towns uh, along the route uh, that he would be coming. And so large crowds would turn out to see Weston the Walker pass through, his, pass through their town on this, uh, this attempt to walk from Boston to Washington. He was four hours late. He didn't make it in time. Uh, but nonetheless, it got him so much attention uh, that he embarked on other long-distance walks. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the uh, circulars uh, that he would pass out when he did, the, did his walks. Uh, in addition to selling these little cards of, him, of, uh, of, of himself, souvenir photographs of himself, uh, he would also solicit advertisers. And uh, this is for the Grover and Baker's Sewing Machine Company. And so he would go to companies and say, look, I'm going to hand out these circulars, and uh, would you like to be included in the circular? It was a very ingenious way to, uh, to uh, finance his trip. And so companies would pay and uh, they would be included in his little advertising circular. And he would hand out thousands of these. Uh, I should mention, Weston's uh, uh, original job was as a door-to-door -door book salesman. And so it's believed his proficiency in walking came from his, uh, you know, his occupation. Uh, and he was also a good salesman, and he wasn't afraid to knock on doors. And he would promise to hand out thousands of these circulars whenever he went on one of his walks. And so companies would uh, gladly pay to be included in Weston's circular, and then uh, that was another way that he would finance his walk. This is another card that Weston uh, handed out. Uh, Weston, uh, during the Civil War, of course, Weston's first walk was in 1861. Uh, the Civil War kind of hurt the whole pedestrianism industry. Uh, but Weston, after the war, then embarked on some more walks. Uh, he did a most famous walk was um, from uh, uh, Portland, Maine to Chicago in 39 days. And uh, this, again, was done on a bet. Um, this is a souvenir photograph that was handed out in one of his later walks after the war. Uh, he was a courier for the Union Army, um, which means he basically volunteered to deliver some letters. It's not known that he ever served in uniform. Uh, he seems to be wearing some kind of uniform here. Um, maybe somebody could help me identify what kind of uniform it is. I have a feeling that uh, Weston uh, had a penchant for self-aggrandizement, 
you know? He was sort of like his era's version of Brian Williams or Bill O'Reilly. Um, so you, can't, you, you couldn't trust everything Weston said, which is one thing that you, you realize when you're researching the book, well, when I was researching the book, is that uh, uh, Weston's autobiographical material was not always 100% honest. And so this might be a little bit of Weston uh, making himself look more uh, heroic than he really was. Nonetheless, uh, another card that apparently sold uh, quite well uh, when he would, uh, when he would uh, do his walks and, and sell these cards along the way. It, re it really was uh, quite an ingenious way for, uh, for him to finance these and for him to be able to make a career, really, out of, out of walking. Uh, he also walked overseas. This is, uh, he would go to uh, London occasionally. This is actually from a poster uh, that advertised one of his walks. He became so famous that really you didn't even need to include his name <laughs> on, on uh, many images. He always walked uh, wearing the, the, the boots, uh, uh, always with a ruffled shirt, and he often wore a sash, carried a riding crop or a cane with him whenever he walked. He was very conscious of his image uh, uh, of his look, about how he appeared. Uh, he didn't dress as a conventional athlete. He dressed as a gentleman, which he always aspired to, uh, you know, cultivate that that image. And, and so it's interesting that uh, he would he would always choose to be posed in these kind of unathletic, uh, unathletic poses. Now, Weston, after the war, uh, 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 there was another boom. Uh, that coincided with uh, uh, Weston's uh, career. And uh, that boom was roller skating, of all things. Uh, the uh, quad skate, which is the kind of roller skate that we still use today, you know, with the four wheels, and you can just sort of shift your weight and it'll change directions. Well, uh, there was a gentleman in, um, in New York, and uh, his name was James Plimpton. And he patented the quad skate in 1863. Plimpton uh, was very ill one winter, and uh, he was prescribed to do uh, ice skating. And so he would ice skate on the Hudson in New York. And then when the spring came, he couldn't ice skate anymore. So he invite, invented the quad skate, the roller skate. And this became a very, very popular, uh, this is a print, by the way, from uh, Harper's, uh, became a very popular pastime in the United States. And so suddenly, roller skating rinks popped up all over the country. It was a fad. Uh, General Sherman was uh, was a fan. I mean, everybody, the, the everybody, the rich and famous did it. The uh, uh, you know, the working man, everybody uh, was into roller skating for a time. But these roller skating rinks, uh, especially in smaller communities, were really the first public venues uh, for athletic events, for enclosed, uh, for indoor events, enclosed spaces uh, that you could hold athletic events in. And so Weston. Uh, capitalized on this. He saw an opportunity. And so what he would do is he would go to a roller skating rink and he'd lay down a track on the floor, a dirt track, and it might be as small as a 40th of a mile around, just basically just walking around a big truck. Um, but then he would uh, advertise to do one of these 24-hour walks and say, I'm going to walk uh, 100 miles in 24 hours. And uh, people would come to the roller rink and gladly pay 10 cents a piece for the pleasure of watching uh, Edward Pace and Weston walk in small circles for 24 hours. And it's probably worth mentioning here as well uh, uh, why pedestrianism was so popular in these events. Uh, uh, there really wasn't much else to do, uh, especially in a small town in the middle of winter. And so watching uh, the famous Weston the Walker come to town and walk in circles uh, for hours on end, uh, you know, if not especially entrancing, uh, was at least an inoffensive way to kill time. And uh, especially for the family, it was family entertainment. You got to remember, your other choices were might be like bear baiting or dog fighting. And so that was not the kind of thing you wanted to take the kids to. Uh, but you could take the kids to see Weston. And many children from this era would remember many, many years later uh, how exciting it was to go watch Weston walk in circles. Here he is uh, from Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper, closely watching Weston as he uh, as he walks in, uh, which I believe is one a roller rink in New York. And uh, he had a stride that was uh, described as wobbly. Uh, that he would, um, he kind of, it was almost like he would, he would move his hips a lot, like, um, like uh, yeah, like speed walkers do if you see them today. But he always walked, it was heel and toe. Weston was not a runner, uh, he was a walker. And uh, kids would imitate the way he walked, the way uh, kids would sometimes imitate you know, the batting stance of their favorite baseball player. That's how, uh, that's how well-known Weston's walk became, which is kind of amazing when you consider 
uh, there really weren't, um, you know, there were, there were no moving pictures of Weston. Uh, he only walked, the only way to know how he really looked when he walked was to go see him in person. Uh, Weston's popularity and his, his um, you know, the, how lucrative this became uh, in, inevitably inspired competitors. Other people saw, hey, this guy can walk, you know, make money walking in a rink for a day. I can do that. And so a lot of people tried. Uh, this is a cigarette card, I believe. Let me double check. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. This is W.S. Kimball tobacco card uh, depicting champion heel and toe pedestrian Dan O'Leary. This card is from 1887. Dan O'Leary rose to become Weston's greatest competitor, his nemesis. I say they were sort of the uh, Ali and Frazier of the day. And uh, Weston was the Ali figure, and Dan O'Leary was sort of the, the Frazier figure, the taciturn uh, not very outgoing, not very gregarious, but definitely good at what he did. He was an Irish immigrant, moved to Chicago a couple years after the Great Fire. He was also a door-to-door -door book salesman. Seems to be the uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, yeah, the training grounds for, uh, uh, for long-distance competitive walkers. And so he uh, embarked on a series of events to, uh, to rival Weston. And his greatest was uh, in 1875, he walked 116 miles in 24 hours, setting a new record at the time. It's pretty phenomenal uh, when you think about it. These guys would walk more or less nonstop for 24 hours. And so uh, his, his success inevitably gave rise to a challenge to Weston. And the two men agreed to meet in a 500-mile race in Chicago. The first to complete 500 miles uh, would be the winner. And it was called the, the uh, match for the pedestrian championship of the world. Uh, as usual, the United States just considered itself. <laughs> Whoever was the champion was the world champion. Uh, this is just an old photograph from the uh, uh, Chicago Historical Society, Chicago History Museum, I think it's called. Uh, the three domes you see in the back right there, that was the uh, Interstate Exposition Building. It was built in 90 days uh, after uh, just two years after the Great Fire, and at the time it was the largest enclosed space, public space in the United States. And this is where Weston and O'Leary decided to stage their great walking match for the championship of the world. Uh, you know, just to put it bluntly, they chose the biggest place they could find. And uh, it ended up being a very, very lucrative match. Uh, Weston lost to O'Leary. Uh, it was kind of an upset at the time. Uh, people didn't think the Great Weston could be beaten, but O'Leary finished the 500 miles. Uh, I don't want to say, well, Weston stopped walking, and he was only about 460 when uh, O'Leary hit 500. And O'Leary instantly became a superstar, a sports superstar in the United States. And this is a little uh, pamphlet that's a biography of O'Leary that was published uh, about the time of uh, these walks. And uh, just an example of... Uh, and this actually was from 76, I believe. Um, but it's an example of, uh, of how uh, companies would capitalize on the fame of these guys and how famous they were in their own right that they uh, merited these kinds of, uh, of instant pulp biographies. Running a little behind. Uh, uh, O'Leary uh, defeats Weston in 1876. So Weston goes to London. And this is the Royal Agricultural Hall in London. And as you can see, it's a huge venue. This is, a, this is from, uh, I think, uh, London Illustrated News, um, depicting an uh, uh, agricultural fair. Those are cows down there. At the time, before the, uh, the Aggie, as it was known, was built in 1876. Before that, all agricultural fairs were held outside, and they weren't very hygienic. So this was kind of state of the art, where they had troughs and everything, and uh, they could kind of keep it clean. And so the Aggie became the uh, venue for indoor sports in uh, the UK, the primary venue. It's actually still existing. It still stands today. It's a, conven it's a yeah, convention center. Um, but it's the only one of the buildings that I came across that uh, uh, is still around. And I thought it was kind of cool. I was walking around, and they actually have a big sign in one of the back entrances that says pedestrian entrance. So I thought, well, I, think that, I don't think they mean it the way I, the way I remember it, but, uh, but it was pretty cool. Uh, so anyway, uh, Weston goes to the UK and rents out the Aggie and challenges uh, top pedestrians in the UK to races. And uh, this is what this is a, a print that I also I think appeared in the London Illustrated News. He takes takes on William Perkins, 
who was uh, the pedestrian champion of England. Uh, it's a 48-hour race, I believe. The interesting thing is um, Perkins was a runner, and so this posed a dilemma. Uh, the, uh, the English pedestrians generally ran. Uh, their races were go as you please. If it was a 24-hour race, you could go any way you want. You could run, hop, skip, jump, crawl. They didn't care. Uh, the Americans, for some reason, always adhered to the fair heel and toe method, and they'd have judges that would watch and make sure that somebody always had one part of the foot on the ground at all times. So Weston challenged this guy to, uh, to a race, and uh, I, like I said, I think it was a 48-hour race, but uh, to solve the dilemma, Weston said, he can run. I'll let him run. I don't care. And so they went out and uh, they did the race, and of course Perkins, after about six or eight hours, had this huge lead, um, but by the end of the first day, his feet were so blistered that he had to drop out, and Weston just kept on walking and walking and walking and did his 200 miles in two days, which he always did, and he was always, con he was always uh, convinced that the other guy would get tired before he did. He had this extraordinary um, uh, stamina, and uh, it, uh, it often helped him win races when people thought it was impossible to do uh, the things that he planned to do. Pedestrianism became very popular then in the UK with the arrival of Weston, and this is a great um, poster, I guess, a broadside. O'Leary uh, saw what Weston was doing in the UK, making money over there, so O'Leary said, hey, wait a minute, I can make some of that money too. And so they staged a rematch in the UK at the uh, Agricultural Hall. Uh, the Agricultural Hall, this is from April of 77, 1877, uh, and uh, the races kind of morphed from 500-mile races to six-day races. Uh, six days was as long as you could race because blue laws prohibited public amusements on the Sabbath, so you couldn't really have a race on Sunday. So six days became the default format for these races, and what they would do is they'd have a band. You can see they had two military bands at this one. That's fancy. And uh, they would begin, the band would start playing on Sunday night, and they would wait to start the race until right after midnight, Sunday night, Monday morning. And then the race would continue straight up until the following Saturday night, right at midnight. So that would be the six days. And then when the, you know, the bands were there in case the guys were taking a rest, they'd have cots in the middle of the arena for these guys to take a rest. And so the, the bands would play while they were resting, that sort of thing. I think a lot of times when you went to see these things, it, they weren't always that exciting. I'll be honest with you. It wasn't... This wasn't, this, this wasn't NASCAR. Um, there would be crashes, but they were very, very slow. Uh, I, I, I want to say the, um, the, the Islington uh, History Center, which is the historical society in this neighborhood in, uh, in London, was so helpful. And thank, thank them. They have saved for almost, I mean, the, the Aggie's still there. It's 100 and, what, 140 years old now. Uh, and they have uh, saved and cataloged the posters from almost every event that was held in that building, from religious revivals, uh, circuses, walking matches, track meet. You can't imagine. And uh, to walk in there and say, you know, is there any chance you have any images? I said, oh, yeah, we got them here. And to pull out a big book and just turn the pages and see the uh, posters from this place. I mean, and they're so helpful if you're ever in, in London. Go there and just, just go look at their archives. It's just a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, here's, a, here's an image from uh, a later match. This is then they would have three or four guys, you know, walking at the same time over six days. I mean, sometimes there'd be 15, 20 people entered in a six-day match. And just to give you an idea of what it looked like then, that's O'Leary uh, in the middle there. And he had the piston-like stride, they said. He walked like a machine. Uh, the other two guys, uh, you can see they're actually walking in different directions. You could change directions, which would only confuse uh, spectators <laughs> even more. So if you walked in on, like, you know, Thursday afternoon, you did have no idea who's in the lead. You have no idea what lap they're on. You'd have, they're all walking in different directions. It must have been, must have been very, very confusing. Uh, this is the primary venue for pedestrianism in the United States. This is a print from the uh, New York Historical Society. This is P.T. Barnum's Grand Roman Hippodrome, which uh, was built by P.T. Barnum, of course, but does not appear to be either Grand Roman or Hippodromish. Uh, it was just a building that was built on a block near Madison Square 
in New York. It, at first, it had no roof. You can see he just put a tent up. Later, a roof was added, and then this became the first Madison Square Garden, first of four. The first two Madison Square Gardens were actually located at Madison Square. Uh, of course, the current one is located nowhere near Madison Square. Uh, this is a card that was sold at uh, pedestrian events. Charles Rowell uh, was a famous pedestrian from the UK and uh, challenged many American pedestrians in the States and uh, came to New York several times and won very big races. Um, and this is a card that was handed out, uh, that was sold as a souvenir, I believe, at, at some of these races. Uh, it's a wonderful, I love how it shows the, the color you know, you, you think of it, of course, as a black and white world, this, this very colorful picture. And uh, they would have the, the most popular um, uh, pedestrians would uh, have uh, cards made, these, these images made, and they would sell them at the races. And uh, it was funny when, uh, excuse me, when I was doing the, doing the book, my editor said, oh, can you find images of, of the cards for all the other racers? I was like, no, they don't. No, they don't. You, they're not that hard. To, they're not that easy to find. They're they're kind of hard to find. This is uh, actually an image that the Smithsonian has. They have a copy of this card. Raoul was a very famous pedestrian at the time, and this is from one of the most famous races. We're really at the peak now, 1879, 1880, and this is one of the races at uh, the old Madison Square Garden. With the the crowd would be both inside and outside the track, and of course, the only way to get from the inside. Uh, to the inside from the outside was to walk across the track, which also <laughs> caused a lot of problems. Uh, the track itself, of course, would just, they, the men would use it as a spittoon and just spit their tobacco juice down under the sawdust track, and it, apparently it was pretty gross, the whole thing. Um, Weston, uh, who's, who's not in this race, but Edward Weston hated smoking, detested tobacco, and would insist that uh, the arena be made non-smoking whenever he competed. And so it really was one of the first attempts to make it a smoke-free environment for, a, for one of these events. I'm not sure how successful it was, uh, but apparently the place would get pretty rank after about three or four days. You know, at, at the early, in, in the early events, you could buy a ticket. A ticket would give, you un, would give you admission to the event as long as you wished to stay. And so there would be guys who would buy a ticket for 50 cents and then basically live in the arena for the rest of the week. It was a place to stay inside, stay warm. They had a cafeteria, they had vendors, you could buy a sandwich for a nickel. And so a dollar would get you a place to stay for a week and two meals a day. It really wasn't, wasn't that bad a deal. Later on, they would uh, issue tickets, uh, they would clear out the arena at 3 or 4 a.m. so they could maximize profit. Uh, this is the uh, cover of a Harper's Weekly, obviously. This, is, uh, this was a famous, defate, de famous uh, match in which uh, 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 Raoul, the Englishman depicted as the lion, defeated O'Leary, who was uh, depicted there as the eagle. And again, a measure of the popularity that you had, the popularity of the event, uh, the popularity of the sport. Puck, a uh, similar picture there. I think that's uh, O'Leary uh, also getting defeated. This is one of my favorite posters from uh, Islington. This is the, um, another match at the Agricultural Hall. This is from 1879. And it gives you a good idea of kind of what they, uh, what they wore and, and how they promoted the events. There would be articles of um, agreement that the guys would have in terms of whether it was going to be a walking match or go as you please, could you, could you run, that sort of thing, how long the match would last. And these guys would win uh, at the time at its peak. You might take home uh, $20,000 which for six days' work in 1879 was not a bad, not a bad, uh, not a bad living, um, except for the having to walk for six days. That, that, was not, that was not fun at all. This is the start of a six-day race. This is a really bad print off a bad piece of microfilm, but the original is missing at, uh, at Library of Congress, unfortunately, but just gives you an idea of the crowd and all the competitors there. Later, there was a kind of crude attempt to at least tell you what lap the, the competitors were on each mile. And so they would spin those dials, and then each lap uh, that they took, they'd move the dial one more, and then eight laps apparently there would accrue a mile. And then there would be a chalk scoreboard maybe that they would write the total mileage for each of the contestants. So later on at least, they made it a little bit more uh, viewer friendly, I guess. Uh, this is a ticket uh, to a pedestrian match. and. I looked everywhere. There must have been millions of these printed, millions of these printed. And I looked everywhere uh, to find one. And finally, uh, matches were held in Washington. I have an article in the Washington Post that's going to be in next weekend 
about uh, pedestrianism in DC in the 19th century, but a lot of the matches there were held in theaters. Uh, they would just take all the folding chairs off the floor of the theater and put down a, put down a little you know, track. And uh, so on a, on a lark, I went to the Historical Society, and they have a theater collection, and lo and behold, I opened up one of the folders for one of the theaters where I knew these matches had been held, and this popped out. And uh, it is a ticket to uh, heel and toe walk, not go as you please. This was a real walk walk. And uh, it took place at the Kernan's Theater in Summer Garden. Uh, now if you go to the site of Kernan's Theater, it's the uh, headquarters for the IRS. So, so if you ever get audited, just think of that. This On the back of this, by the way, was a shopping list. Um, I remember apples were on it, which may be why it somehow survived. Uh, these last three slides, I, I want to thank a um, uh, couple of people who gave me uh, a couple slides. Barbara and uh, uh, Richard uh, gave me these three slides, and they just kind of demonstrate how popular pedestrianism was and how it was used to sell just about everything. This is Huntley and Palmer's biscuits, of course. Uh, this is sheet music. The go as you, the go as you please, grand. Now, is that? Is it gallop or galop? Because it's only one L, and apparently one L is a dance, and two Ls is what the horse does. Is that right? Um, but anyway, these are some famous pedestrians. The lower right there is Frank Hart, who was the most famous African-American pedestrian, won, won several uh, major matches. And then I love this, uh, the uh, brass shoe nails. I mean, I mean, even today, it's hard to find good brass shoe nails. Uh, so back then, it was no different. And here you see Widden's nails for me, and his shoes are fine. And the other guy's not using Widden's brass shoe nails, and his shoes are falling off. So another demonstration of how popular the sport was. Uh, that is the end of my comments. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. You may applaud, please. Yes. Yeah, the uh, a thousand uh, a thousand miles in a thousand hours for a thousand guineas. Oh, oh no, no, no. I'm I'm sorry. You're probably talking about uh, the big poster. Yes. Earlier. This one. Yes. Right, uh, so they would each have their own track, yes. So if it was two people, um, often they would each, to avoid having to, and then again, and this would be in the, ar uh, the Articles of Agreement, uh, it was often, it was very, very contentious deciding what the track would be made of. Some guys like soft tracks, some guys like hard tracks, some guys just like uh, pressed, uh, you know, uh, compressed dirt, some guys like mulch. It was called tan bark. The tan bark was kind of the gridiron of the, of the pedestrianism. So if you had a match that was just between two people, often you would just have two tracks. You can each make your own track, and you would decide. One track, of course, would be a little shorter, so you would have to draw lots to see who gets the inside, who gets the outside. And then once that was decided, you could compose the track however you wanted it. Yeah, um, really, you had some of the first. It's uh, oh, wait a minute! I have a copy of it right here. In pedestrianism, when watching people walk was America's favorite spectator sport, I talk a little bit about the. Sh uh, you did do that right. You'll get your twenty bucks. Don't worry. Uh, but I talk in the book a little bit about uh, the shoe, uh, the, the evolution of the shoe and the walking shoe. And Weston and O'Leary both had their shoes custom made. All the guys had their shoes custom made, and there were shoemakers. Uh, in New York and in London, both who specialized in making shoes for the best pedestrians. Some liked a very soft shoe that would just wrap tight. Weston preferred a big heel. He liked a big, heavy shoe. Uh, not shoe deals um, that I know of, but they were spoke. They they did get uh, deals. Uh, O'Leary was the spokesperson for uh, a brand of salt. Um, hang on here. Somebody just came up to me before the event and gave me. These are socks. These are Weston socks. Who, who gave these to me? Here. Yes, thank you. I need to get... Yeah, there's the box. These are the celebrated Weston walking socks. 
So he, uh, he, uh, he, he was the spokesperson for these. Uh, they were spokesperson th for all kinds of things. Now that you mention it, I can't imagine there wasn't a shoe company that didn't have a uh, pedestrian as a spokesperson. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Weston uh, continued walking late into life. He walked his whole life. Um, the period I'm looking at is 1870s, 1880s, but Weston, well into the early 20th century, went on long distance walks. And in 1906, I believe, he walked from New York to San Francisco. Um, and uh, he was, uh, had, a, had a team that went with him in a car, but he did the walk and again used his usual strategy of selling advertising space in a circular that he then sold for a dime. And so that's how he did it. Weston lived, uh, uh, Weston lived to be uh, 92, but when he was 90, he was crossing a street in New York and was hit by a car, which is the ironic end for a pedestrian, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but he lived to be an old man, and so did O'Leary. O'Leary lived, uh, lived to be in his late 80s, and O'Leary would stage walking exhibitions before baseball games, and he would go and challenge, say, the fastest runner uh, on the team to run around the bases twice while he walked around the bases once. And then, you know, the winner would be whoever got to home first. And then O'Leary would walk around the uh, ballpark, hat in hand, literally, uh, collecting nickels and dimes, and this is how he got himself through the Great Depression. And it's amazing to think, too, and I talk about it in the book, which, again, it's right there. Um, <laughs> but I talk about it in the book, you know, in, like, 1927, 1928, uh, these, think about the ball players sitting there. Well, they're, they're too young to remember anything from the days of pedestrianism, and they would have been amazed to learn that this old man walking around the bases out there had made more money in a year than any of them would ever make in a year. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> yes, I did that on purpose. Yes, sporting life right there. <laughs> All right, get your own presentation, okay? Right. Yeah, uh, the question is, is there any connection between pedestrianism and the uh, marathon dancing um, uh, events that were held, especially, I guess, in the 20s and 30s? Um, not really. I mean, the most direct connection, what happened with pedestrianism is that, uh, uh, well, baseball became, of course, was very popular, boxing was popular, um, but uh, it was uh, uh, the, the invention of the safety bicycle in the 1890s, remember before that, they had the giant, the penny farthings with the giant big wheel and the little back wheel, and then the safety bicycle was invented, and so watching these guys race for six days was much more interesting than watching people walk for six days. And so the, I think there's more of a connection really between uh, six-day bicycle racing and, and the marathon dancing that came later, uh, because they're really connected in time. I mean, six-day bicycle races were popular well into the 20s and 30s, and so there's definite overlap with that whole idea of you know, doing marathon. You had guys sitting on flagpoles for days at a time. You had marathon dancing. And so I think if there was any inspiration from that, it probably came more from the bicycles than from the pedestrians. Yeah. Yeah, door-to-door well, -door book salesmen uh, and, uh, and uh, dogs and riding crops. Yeah, Weston hated dogs. He was deathly afraid of them, and, that, and I hadn't thought of that, to be honest. Might be one reason that he always walked with a cane or a riding crop. In fact, he would go out of his way on one of his lo overland walks uh, to avoid dogs. And when, you hear, when he writes his accounts of, uh, of uh, his, his walks, uh, he'll always mention the dogs that he had to deal with. Um, when he did his walk from Portland, Maine to Chicago, he was staying at a hotel in Chicago, and one of his fans came and presented him with a gift, and the gift was a puppy. <laughs> and uh, after the guy left, Weston went to the window and threw the puppy out on the street. <laughs> he hated dogs. Yeah, real quick. Yeah. 
yeah, uh, Weston wrote uh, at least one autobiography uh, that we know of, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, don't, don't believe most of it. Buy my book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think, I think it had the meaning, um, that connotation, even at the time. And I'm trying to think. I had actually thought of a good comparison, a word that can mean, uh, and I, it's not coming to me, a word that can mean both exciting and boring at the same time, because I had this, kind of like this talk. Um, but I, I'm not sure. I think it might have had that connotation at the time. Oh, yeah, there were bookies. Yep. Yep, and that was another thing that brought pedestrianism down. It was race fixing. Um, because you could bet on anything. I mean, you could bet on the first guy to drop out of the race, who would be in third place on Tuesday night at 8 p.m., who, you know, uh, who anything, who was in first, last, middle. And so what you would have is guys would conspire with a bookie to say, you know, I'm going to drop out of the race on Tuesday morning. And so he would take bets. Okay, what are the odds that uh, Johnson's going to drop out of the race on Tuesday morning? Well, no, he's fit. He'll never drop out of the race. And so this was really one of the downfalls. There was no over. There was no overarching governing body for this sport at all. It was just promoters and the guys. I mean, um, baseball finally got together, created the National League. They had a, articles of incorporation. They had a governing board, and now we have a commissioner. But they had nothing like that. And so there's nobody to police the sport. I think I'm running out of time. Well, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope I was mildly amusing. Thank you.